Hi, you guys. It's me, Professor Daniel, your favorite history professor, and I am back with another lesson. But before I begin, just a little bit of housekeeping. So I want to remind you guys to continue look at the syllabus. The syllabus is your guideline. It provides a tentative outline for everything that will be done in this course. If you are looking at the syllabus, there should be no surprises about what is coming uh, in the semester. This isn't just good advice for my course. This is advice for any course that you will take at any institution throughout your collegiate career. That is why your professors create the syllabus, so you will know what is going on and it teaches you a bit of personal responsibility. So please, please, please make sure you are looking and reading the syllabus. Um, you may want to go back to the Welcome to 1301 video so you can review expectations for the course. All right, but moving on. So in today's lesson, uh, we will be reviewing chapter eight in your text, which is titled Securing the Republic. And it spans from about, from about 1791 to 1815. So in last chapter, we talked about creating or the creation of the constitution. And in chapter, we will deal with now that the Constitution is created, we are the founding fathers have to decide what is constitutional. Um, what do we want this nation to look like? Do we want it to mirror Great Britain? Or do we want to create something that's altogether different? That is going to be something that is debated among founding fathers, especially between, for example, Hamilton and Jefferson. Jefferson has an idea of how he feels the United States should grow, whereas you have others who have a completely different idea of how the United States should grow. Should we remain agrarian or agri um, agriculturally based as Jefferson would like, or should we go into manufacturing the way that a many uh, federalists will suggest? So let's hop into the chapter. Your chapter actually begins prior to 1791 and 1789 with the inauguration of George Washington. Now, Washington, if we remember, was the commander of the Continental Army. He has a lot of, dare I say, societal clout. A lot of people know him. He is seen as the victor of the American Revolution. He is seen as the person who brings us through. He as a natural leader. So it's really not surprising that he's chosen to be the first president of the United States on April 30th, 1789 in New York City. We don't have a permanent national capital yet, but we will discuss uh, how we get our nation's capital a little further on in the lecture. Now, his vice president is John Adams, his secretary of state is Thomas Jefferson, and the head of the Treasury Department is Alexander Hamilton. Now, another reason why I like to um, enjoy this chapter is that we're getting to a period of U.S. history that a number of you guys will be familiar with. You are familiar with these names, um, especially now since I know a number of you have watched um, Hamilton. Um, the musical, including myself, it is amazing, I will say. Um, but I really like this because you guys are actually becoming familiar with a lot of these names. Now, before we really begin, I really want to make sure you guys realize that at this time, people run as individuals, not as parties. There is no party ticket. Whoever gets the most votes is president, whoever gets the second um votes is vice president. So you don't run as parties. That means that your president could be of one political party and your vice president could be of another political party. So you can decide for yourselves something that you think would work today if you perhaps had a vice president and president who were of opposing political parties. Is that something that could work today? But I digress. So again, we have George Washington, who was the first president of the United States. His vice president is John Adams. Thomas Jefferson is the secretary of state and the secretary of the treasury, the person who is responsible for the fiscal 
or planning for the fiscal or economic success of the United States is Alexander Hamilton. Now, the long-term goal that Hamilton has for the United States to make this new nation a major commercial and military power. But in order to do this, he has to have a plan. So he institutes a five-part program, which I will explain now. So the first part of his five-part program was to establish the new nation's creditworthiness, meaning that he would create conditions where people would be able to loan money to the government. Um, and how do we loan money to the government? by uh, buying bonds. So people will have an opportunity to purchase government bonds. So that money, once they purchase these bonds, the money goes directly to the government. So this would help people to loan money to the national government. Two, he also figured we need to create a new national debt where the old debts that they had before would be replaced by new interest bearing bonds to the government's creditors with lower interest rates. OK, so that is number two, create a new national debt. So these old debts would be replaced by new interest bearing bonds issued by the government's creditors uh, that would have also lower interest rates. The third part of his program would be to create a bank of the United States. Now, prior to this, the United States doesn't have a bank that serves as its main financial agent. So Hamilton knows it's important to have a bank in the United States. Now, while I'm explaining his five-part program, also recognize that there is opposition to this. A lot of people don't want a national bank. They feel that creating a bank of the United States, which was which essentially mirrored like the Bank of Great Britain, they felt that it would open up the United States to a lot of corruption. And a lot of people, since again, we are just now gaining independence, they don't want to run into a lot of the same issues that Great Britain had had with corruption, with uh, the government being able to easily fall under the of merchants or other moneyed or propertyed individuals. But I digress. Number four, they also come up with another way to raise money through uh, levying taxes uh, on whiskey to raise revenue. Now, you're probably thinking whiskey, you're, you're taxing the drink, but it's also not just taxing whiskey, it's taxing what it takes to create whiskey. Whiskey is made from grain such as corn, wheat, rye, barley, and so it's a taxi or a on these grains. And remember at this time, the United States is still relatively agrarian. The United States is still, you know, relatively um, agriculturally based. And so this is something that is going to impact a number of people and they'll actually rebel because of it. Yeah. And the last thing, uh, Hamilton wants to impose a pretty high tariff and he wants to uh, have the establishment of government subsidies, i.e. grants, uh, to encourage the development of factories. He really wanted this last thing, especially the subsidies or the grants essentially is what government subsidies are, because he wanted the United States to be able to manufacture its products instead of having to depend on importing them from Great Britain. So this is Hamilton's five-point program. However, it's not necessarily met with a lot of resounding success. Now, while a lot of people will support the program, a lot of uh, former Federalists will support the program, um, people are financiers who are merchants and manufacturers. If I were a manufacturer, I probably would support a program that is going to get a grant to continue to build my business, right? There are a number of people, however, who do not support Hamilton's program, most notably James Madison and Thomas Jefferson. They oppose Hamilton's program. One, Thomas Jefferson has his own vision of what he believes the 
America um, or the future of America should be. He believes that the future success of the nation really was focused on um, westward expansion, was on having um, an agrarian society where land ownership is seen as the basis of freedom. And they're really a the system that is going to essentially give the United States uh, these connections with Europe. For Jefferson and people who followed them, his goal was to have a republic of independent farmers who would market grain and tobacco and other products freely to the world. And they also felt that having a national bank would introduce a lot of the same corruption that it plagued Britain. Now, after the Revolutionary War, the United States was in a lot of debt, about $54 million in debt to be exact. Another issue that a lot of states would have is that in taking on this new national debt that is part of Hamilton's plan, every state has to pay taxes in order to cover the debt of other states. Now, after the Revolutionary War, states like Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, and Pennsylvania paid off their debt. And so they will oppose Hamilton's plan because they feel that they're having to pay money in order to pay off the debts of other states. And they felt that they shouldn't be taxed for other states because, again, they would paid off their debt. But in the creation of a new national debt, each state would be taxed cover all of that. So a lot of states will, I will say states that have paid off their individual debt will oppose Hamilton's plan for that. Why pay for other states? We've already paid off our money, so why should I have to assume more debt for these other states? And so there is a number. Um, I will say there's a lot of opposition to Hamilton's plan, but we do end up adopting it. And how do we end up adopting this plan? Well, they end up adopting this plan, honestly, through the help of Thomas Jefferson. So in 1790, Jefferson will broker an agreement where Southerners, who were largely opposed to Hamilton's plan, will end up accepting his fiscal plan. Why did these people disagree with Hamilton's plan? Well, one, again, why assume the debts of states if you've already paid off your debt? So that will be a big one. And another one is that people will argue that Hamilton's uh, program is actually unconstitutional, that he is giving Congress too much power. And so a lot of people will look at that and say, we, we agree to this constitution, but what you're doing is not in the constitution. So a few years, honestly, after the constitution is adopted, we're already having debates on the interpretation of this document. So this uh, debates over the interpretation of the Constitution, it's not new because right after the United States is formed, there are already debates on the interpretation of, uh, of this document. A lot of opponents to Hamilton's plan will say that it's constitutional because nowhere in the United or in the Constitution does it give someone the power to create a national bank. However, Hamilton will say that his plans are indeed um, authorized by the Constitution because there is a clause that empowers con um, Congress to enact laws uh, for the general welfare of the people. And so he'll say, look, I'm covered under this. So Jefferson brokers a deal. At a 1790 dinner, uh, he says, look, how about you accept this deal and if you accept the deal, we will promise to give you a, na um, a national capital that is located in the South. So Southerners decide to accept Hamilton's fiscal program um, as long as the national capital is located on the Potomac River between Virginia and Maryland. So that is where we get Washington, D.C. Now for Southerners, uh, I'm, a, you know, I'm a Texan, so I view Maryland as not being in the South. But remember, Maryland is a part of the Southern United States, as is, um, as is Virginia. And so they get a national capital that is located in the South. They do this and they accept this uh, fiscal program because they feel that to have a national capital 
in the South means that the power of the South or Southern governments would be enhanced, right? And so they see it as a benefit. Now, some of the surveying for the national capital or for the nation's capital rather is done in part by Benjamin Banneker. And in part of your, uh, as part of your module seven assignments, there was a video from Ted Ed that I gave you guys about Benjamin Banneker. Yes, he does um, a lot of the survey and he writes Thomas Jefferson um, a letter and sends him a handwritten copy of his almanac. So um, it's considered to be one of the first uh, like civil rights protest letters uh, that we have penned, okay? Now, by the time we get to Hamilton's plan and after the Constitution, written, we do have political parties. However, when we are, when they are running for election, they don't run as a party. There's no party ticket by which you pick or by which the president and vice president come as a pair. No, you may be a part of a party, but you still run as an individual. So these political parties that we have at this time, because again, they will switch. The political parties that we have at this time are your federalists, and your Republicans. So let's talk about the Federalists. Federalists will support Washington's administration. George Washington himself is a Federalist, as is John Adams. They favor Hamilton's plan. They favor having close ties with a lot of merchants and farmers and lawyers and established political leaders will be Federalists. Honestly, they're generally elitist in a way. They believe that political or public office should be reserved for men of means. That's why I say that they're generally elitist. If you have money, it still goes with that tradition of deference. If you have money, education, and wealth, and social prominence, right, that you are entitled to public office. So it's this idea that if you have means, you are the one who should be able to lead the nation. And they also believe that in order to have true American freedom, there has to be freedom rests on deference to authority. So in order for the United States to fully function, you have to defer or look to those who are in authority, right? So those are your federalists your lawyers, your merchants. They favor Hamilton's program and they favor Washington's administration. Now, the other political party we have at this time are, are is the Republican Party. It's not the same as Lincoln's Republican Party and it is certainly not the same as today's Republican Party. So please try to take them out of this context. The Republicans are led by James Madison and Thomas Jefferson and to a lot of Federalists, they see them as traitors. They see them as anarchists because of the role um, and the positions that they will take, right? So they believe that Federalism gave too much power to the upper class leaving the lower class, leaving the lower classes rather to kind of scrounge for themselves. They believe freedom is something is, uh, they believe that freedom is something that was individual, <clears throat> excuse me, and that states should have individual rights. They favor a power being localized, I would say at the state level rather than at the national level. Now you have a great number of, uh, of Republicans. You have wealthy Southern planters who will support the Republican party as well as ordinary yeoman farmers. They will also support the Republican party. Republicans are more critical of socioeconomic inequality and they're more accepting of broad democratic participation, meaning more people should be able to vote, more people should be able to be, uh, should hold or should be able to hold public office. Now you're probably wondering with ideals like this, why would Federalists view them as anarchists or traitors? Well, some of this is because of the French Revolution. Um, the French Revolution um, is occurring at the same time as this chapter. And what happens abroad is going to have an impact on what is happening here in the United States. And in 1789, while the French Revolution 
going on, Republicans will actually be very sympathetic because they view the French Revolution as being a victory for uh, the idea of self-government. They view this uprising as being, um, as, a, uh, as being a victory for the people. Now for Federalists, so for Washington and for Hamilton and a lot of his supporters, they look at the French Revolution and they say, ooh, this is anarchy. This is disorder. This is not what we want, okay? So we continue with John Jay's Treaty of 1794. So during this time, a lot of British exports are starting to flood the U.S. market, but U.S. exports are being blocked. And British at this time, we like to think that after the American Revolution that British people just left, that they all leave. And that's false. The British, even in 1790 and 1791 and 92, up until 94 and 95, the British are continuing to occupy some of these forts, especially like in Western Pennsylvania. And so there's also this policy known as impressment. I-M-P-R-E-S-S-M-E-N-T. Impressment. So impressment is essentially defined as this practice where a government or an army rather will force people to uh, fight for them, right? So they would take American soldiers and put them on British ships and force them into the British Navy. So we have this policy impressment that is going on. There has been this impressment, the British impressment of American soldiers. There has been seizure of a lot of our naval supplies. And so John Jay's treaty of 1794 will call for uh, the British to abandon outposts on America's western frontier, and it will also cancel the American-French alliance. So if we go back to the war. If we go back to the Revolutionary War, recall that it's really these imperial rivalries that ensure American success. It's uh, we have a treaty with France where they supply uh, military support. So John Jay's treaty that cancels this alliance is actually very, very unpopular with the public. So that's part one. I'll continue with part two in just a second.